It's, it's my great pleasure to welcome um, Stephen Bopart today, uh, who is the Abel Bliss Professor of Engineering at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, and he's also the director of the Center for Optical Molecular Imaging. Um, Stephen received his Bachelor's of Science and his Master's of Science, both in electrical engineering at Illinois. Um, and then he went on to complete his doctorate in medical and electrical engineering at MIT in 1998. Um, following that, he went to uh, complete a medical degree um, from Harvard Medical School in 2000 and uh, his clinical residency in internal medicine um, back, back in Illinois. Um, so his, his research seeks to advance the field of, of biophotonics both in primary care medicine as well as in surgical applications. And I, personally, I've followed Stephen's work for uh, for a number of years now, and I can honestly say that he's truly a luminary in the world of, of optical coherence tomography. Um, it's difficult to overstate the impact that he's had on that field. He has published over 300 invited and contributed publications, has over 40 patents, and mentored over 100 undergraduates. And somehow, during all that, he found time to co-found two companies, Diagnostic Photonics and Photonic Care Incorporated. So with that, it's my great honor to welcome you here today uh, to deliver this Jones Seminar. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, John, for that, uh, that introduction. And I also want to extend my appreciation to, uh, to Brian Pogue and others that had, uh, welcomed me here. And it was great to, to meet with uh, many of you and some students over lunch as well. Uh, it's just been truly a pleasure to be here uh, and, and visit Dartmouth again. I think one of the things that's just phenomenal about this place is, is just how closely engineering is tied with medicine and, and biology and, and to be co-located in so many ways. And that, that's an, a huge advantage for, for innovation, for ideas, for research, and uh, really to change, change the world. So what I want to talk about a little bit today is, is biophotonics for, for imaging in medicine and surgery. And, and I know this is a, a fairly general audience, so I thought I would start by defining what exactly is biophotonics? And it's, it's really the science, the technology, the application of light uh, interacting with biological materials. And, uh, and this, there's so many different phenomena that can take place uh, when this happens. In my particular area, we take biophotonics and we apply it to imaging, so biomedical imaging. And, uh, and biomedical imaging has, has played a, a significant role in, in, in detection of disease, in and looking at disease mechanisms, monitoring treatment. And it's very important for us to, to think about biomedical imaging, uh, structural imaging, across multiple scales. And similarly, it's important for us to think about function. How can we image the function of, of tissues, of cells, of molecules in living systems, even in humans? Now, you're famil familiar with a lot of the medical imaging modalities that exist out there, CT, MRI, ultrasound. Those are pretty, uh, I think, common, almost household uh, terms, but, uh, but it really only allows us to look at this end of the spectrum. And if we want to get down to this scale uh, to look at structure and function at the cellular or the molecular level, uh, we have to turn to some other modalities. And light is one of those that affords us this, this ability to look at that cellular and molecular world. Now, the other reason for doing this is if we understand that disease uh, begins at the molecular, the cellular level, if we're ever going to have early detection of disease, we want to be operating and thinking and imaging and sensing down at these size scales. So that's really the motivation for why I'm really interested in using light and biophotonics uh, for imaging in, in disease. So my work, uh, my lab, is the Biophotonics Imaging Lab. And it really is at this nexus between engineering, medicine, and biology, and how we can develop new technologies to solve some of the problems that uh, are faced in medicine and also try to understand some of the fundamental processes that take place in biology. And if we think about historically, many of the great achievements that have come and discoveries that have come through biology or, or treatments in medicine have driv been driven by technologies. And I think that plays a special uh, role for engineering. Now, more specifically, my work is also involved in translational research. And so translational meaning, how can we take technologies out of the lab and actually get them to be used for, say, a disease detection in patients and, and, and translate those for medical applications. 
Well, in my lab, we do a lot of different things. So uh, we're engineers at heart, so we even build laser sources. We build uh, imaging systems with the idea of taking them into clinical studies in the future. Uh, we, we develop a lot of the software algorithms, the computational approaches that allow us to improve our, our image quality, but also automated detection of disease. Now, with the hardware and the software, we, we apply this at many different scales. We look at cells, uh, even in living organisms. We look at microstructure, the vasculature. These, these optical techniques allow us to peer into tissue and see these types of changes in different ways. We can use optics to also measure changes in mechanical properties or movement within tissue. And, and we know that the mechanics changes in disease as well. Now, oftentimes, we have to label or identify or target certain areas of disease, and we use contrast agents to do that. So these contrast agents uh, give us a unique signature, maybe optically or in other modalities, and molecularly, they can be targeted to, say, tumor cells that overexpress a certain receptor or molecule on their surface. We've also been interested in neurophotonics. Uh, I don't know if people are aware of this field of optogenetics, but the ability of, uh, to have light now control function of neurons and cells is opening up a new area. Ultimately, a lot of this work ends up in these clinical applications. And you can see that this is really a, a circuitous process by which we continually think of new ways of, of solving these medical problems. And then what we learn in the medical problems allows us to improve on the technology. So this, again, is a, a very uh, circuitous process that's reinforcing on each cycle. Now, of course, we have to get that out. Uh, and so that translational research is often then leaves the lab once developed and it can be commercialized. And so I've been involved in uh, two companies here, Diagnostic Photonics and Photonicare, that allows us to take technologies then that we develop in the lab and be, become more widely disseminated, distributed, and make a clinical impact. And I'll talk more about that at the end. Well, I, I wanted to thank my group and collaborators and funding agencies up front uh, because we always run out of time at the end. But the point being that we have, it takes a lot of different people with a lot of different expertise uh, and different um, levels of education and expertise to come together for this interdisciplinary research. And so I, in my lab, I've always encouraged a lot of undergraduates to come in and participate. I have graduate students from not only engineering, but also physics and chemistry and biology and medicine. A lot of clinical collaborators all coming together to try to solve these problems. And, and it's not unlike what is here at Dartmouth as well, being able to have no boundaries between uh, disciplines, but being able to work together uh, to solve some of these very complex problems. So if I think about our healthcare system, one way that I like to break this down into to parts is, is this way. And, and, and whether that be the front line of primary care, or the emergency room, or the operating room, or the specialist. And if we think about technologies in these different areas, uh, my first thought that comes to mind is that of the specialist. And it seems like the specialist gets a lot of the, the, the cool tools, right? These are the technologies that get developed uh, because you're trying to diagnose disease and figure out what's going wrong. And so these can be very sophisticated tools uh, for that specialist. But the more we thought about this, if we want to catch disease early, patients are not seen first by their specialist. They're seen by primary care or maybe in the emergency room. And we looked at those settings and realized that there's already optical instruments, the otoscope to look in the ear, the ophthalmoscope to look in your eyes. There are already a precedent of these optical technologies in these frontline settings. And we thought, could we even do better than what technology already exists there? So if we think about what are today's frontline tools that a primary care physician uses? Well, he or she is going to use their senses predominantly. They look at the patient, they see, is there something wrong with that patient? Uh, they'll listen, listen to the heart rate or the breathing. They'll take a whiff and smell and see if there's any uh, odors that can signify disease. Uh, not too many physicians taste their patients these days. They used to. Um, you know, if you lick your skin of a cystic fibrosis patient, it might be salty. Uh, and so these were a diagnostic, a tool. Um, and we palpate, we feel for differences in the mechanical properties of tissue that might indicate disease. So pretty rudimentary tools. Now, if we, get, if we look more closely, well, they may use a, a stethoscope, which is simply just a tube uh, that you know, amplifies, kind of acoustically amplifies the heart sounds. Uh, may, they may hit you with a hammer, right? Or they may ring a little bell in your ear to test your hearing. 
More sophisticated might be a blood pressure cuff or ultimately these, these optical instruments to look, again, at the surface of the tissue, uh, in your ears, in your eyes, your skin, et cetera. So these are really the primary tools. And we asked, can we do something better? Now, the further motivation of this work is that roughly 50% of visits uh, are to a primary care physician, whether that be a pediatrician, a family practitioner, or internal medicine. And uh, we simply wanted to ask, can we advance those tools uh, to be a little bit more sophisticated, to give more information than just that magnified view of the tissue that, that physicians look at? OK, well, the technology we use to do this uh, is called optical coherence tomography, or OCT. And you can think of OCT as the optical analog to ultrasound. So instead of putting in sound waves and we generate an image of a fetus, we put in light waves and we measure with interferometry where those, those light waves come back. And we can assemble an image, a cross-sectional image, that's very high resolution, about 100 times higher resolution than ultrasound. And we can see individual cells. This is the beating heart of a tadpole that's about the size of the tip of your pencil. Uh, very small, high resolution, label free, just based on the inherent scattering properties of the tissue. So this technology was something I helped develop during my graduate school work and, uh, and really has permeated a lot of areas of medicine. We can, we can build up these images based on a single depth scan or, or scanning multiple places and essentially assemble a three-dimensional data set of, of the, the scattering properties in the tissue. And that tells us something about what's going on, not at the surface, but but below. We can put these systems into, uh, um, into various systems, and this is with a handheld. Uh, so this is the, the core technology that was borrowed from a lot of the telecommunications technologies. But we engineer a handheld probe that we're trying to get closer and closer to an, that otoscope or that ophthalmoscope. And in this particular case, we have different tips that you can change to, to image different parts of, of the body. And well, how does this work? So if we have this instrument, this is uh, an early design that had a monitor, a touch panel on the back. And we can see not only the video surface image, but also this cross-sectional image of the retina there, uh, or the skin, or the eardrum. And it's an instrument that allows us then to be able to see both you know, the surface and below the surface in real time. Again, in real time, without the use of any types of dyes. And these are just a series of different screenshots from that in vivo data from humans. And uh, if you look at your fingernail, the space between uh, the nail and the skin is the cuticle. And that's what's shown here in, in cross-section. This is the, uh, the epithelium of your cheek, the inside of your cheek, possibly looking for cancer. Or skin, this is your cornea. And you think your cornea, the front of your eye, is transparent. But this is so sensitive to scattering, you can see individual cells and structures within that seemingly transparent cornea. This is your eardrum. This is the back of your eye, the, the fovea, and the optic disc the, the, of the retina, uh, the back part of your eye. So all of a sudden, we can see much, much more information, subsurface information about these tissue structures. Well, when you go to the doctor and, and they start examining you, these are some of the common sites that they'll look at. And, uh, and so we, started, we, we said, let's start with the ear. Um, for many reasons, as you'll see. But this is you know, one ap application from, from primary care. And the application is trying to detect uh, ear infections. Now, very, very infrequently do you see the smiling little girl with an ear infection. More likely, you see the, the screaming little child that very painful ear infections. You know, 98%, um, a large number, roughly, of, of of kids will have ear infections. And roughly about 50% of those will develop into chronic infections. Uh, and that becomes problematic. The, the physician has to diagnose what type of ear infection is going on. The problem is that the physician is looking at the surface. And the infection takes place in the middle ear, behind the eardrum. And so trying to figure out what's behind there uh, has always been the, the, the challenge. Now, there's complications of speech and language delays or hearing loss if, if this isn't treated effectively. And unfortunately, you know, our treatment regimens are antibiotics uh, or surgery. And in fact, this is a scenario which has the highest rate of overprescription of antibiotics simply because, again, the physician can't decide what's going on inside that ear. Okay, 
this is not just an issue in developed countries, but in developing countries as well. Imagine if you don't have access to the antibiotics or the treatment or the surgery, uh, you know, patients can have lifelong disabilities of, of speech and language deficits, of hearing deficits, and that can impact their, their quality of life lifelong. So it's, it's not necessarily a disease that's going to, to kill you, um, but it's something that's going to affect your, your, your quality of life for, for decades to come. Okay, well, these infections, you know, are something we've, we've all experienced. Uh, many of you probably had ear infections as a, as a child. Probably about one in 10 of you have had tubes placed in your, your, your ears to help treat chronic infections. Uh, there's 25 million annual visits of these infections in the U.S. Uh, each year. And the problem is just immense, and it's costly. So about 7% of children will receive this surgery to place small little drainage tube, tubes in your eardrum to drain the infection that keeps coming back, okay? And it's expensive. Three billion spent to diagnose and treat, four billion spent to place those tubes in that surgery. So again, it's a major problem for us. And the challenge is that physicians have subjective data. And I would say that if, if any of the engineers in the audience want to make a lifelong career, it's simply choosing one area in medicine that is currently based on subjective information and make it objective with your engineering solutions. And that alone will solve you know, huge problems in medicine. But this is one example of those. So to go from this view, just a magnified view, uh, how do we go ahead, uh, determine and, and, and make something objective, OK? Well, it's subjective, and the numbers show that. So there's a 50% misdiagnosis rate for primary care physicians to get that diagnosis correct for ear infections. With, in the hands of a specialist, their accuracy rises to 60 to 70%, but that's still not very good. So you go to the doctor, they flip a coin to determine whether or not you've got an ear infection and whether or not you need antibiotics. And that's not a, a very good scenario to be in. So we want to move from the subjective interpretation to one that becomes objective. Can we measure, can we characterize structures you know, in that ear? And go from a view that looks like this to a view that looks like this with OCT. So now this is that eardrum in cross-section. So this is the ear canal space above, and this is the middle ear space behind that eardrum. And we use an instrument that looks like this. It's a modified otoscope uh, that allows us that view now, that OCT view. Now, when we started doing these studies, uh, we, we were completely surprised to discover that, again, it's not a binary decision. Do you have an infection or not? But we started seeing all different types of, of biofilms and structures within the middle ear. There are two main things. There's an effusion, or fluid, that can be scattering that's filled with bacteria that are floating around. But in a chronic case, what we now know is that those bacteria form a biofilm that coats the middle ear. And a biofilm is a collection of, of, of it's a polymicrobial community of bacteria that's in a protective matrix that the bacteria make. And it's protective, so if, in a child with a biofilm, Antibiotics, we believe, are no longer effective. They're not going to be able to remove the, that biofilm that has established. And so this could be a, a completely uh, you know, profound way to change or, 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 or diagnose and assess this very common disease. So we learned and, and thought more about that. But what we want to do is, is move from these subjective measures. And maybe if we now see an image that looks like this, that looks normal, we watch and wait. If we see an effusion there, those by the guidelines are clearly when you give antibiotics. But if you see a biofilm, those antibiotics may no longer work. And perhaps that child should go to surgery, since we know that's a, an effective treatment. We don't really have a pharmacological treatment to treat biofilms that once they're established. So this is something that um, we think will change practice. Uh, from the, the engineers in us, we want to, to do this in real time and, and automate it, so we can automatically measure the thickness of that eardrum provide that information, and we're continuing a lot of different longitudinal clinical studies to, to be able to show that this is indeed something that's very effective, and a new way of thinking about treating and monitoring ear infections. Okay, well that was one area of healthcare. The other is in, in the operating room, and what can we do to improve and, and think about the problems there? Well here, we think about taking optical biopsies of breast cancer, so doing this in the operating room. And the issue is most of breast cancer and a lot of tumors are diagnosed in the path lab. 
Okay, but we thought about how can we move that diagnosis point to the operating room and really change the paradigm for when, where, and how we assess tissue or disease microscopically. Essentially, can we give that microscope to the surgeon to give that information in real time? Now, the problem is, is this. So in breast cancer surgery, um, uh, breast cancer is often diagnosed with mammography. Uh, they'll put a needle in there to, to pull out some tissue and make sure that it is cancer. That patient will go to surgery. They send the tissue samples to pathology, and it takes five days to section all that and look microscopically. Okay, well, the fact is roughly one out of three patients that undergo breast reduction surgery have to be recalled for reoperation because they only discover days later that some tumor cells have been left behind. And that's because the surgeon can't see microscopically for those cells. So our solution was to really put that imaging technology in the hands of the surgeon to assess those margins and hopefully prevent those re-excision surgeries. And because there's one and a half million breast cancer surgery cases worldwide each year, that can be a huge savings, not to mention the reducing the anxiety and the effort and time for patients to come back for multiple surgeries. Okay, well, how do we do this? We use OCT for this, and we built a, a portable system. Now, in, in conjunction with a company, built a, a safe handheld probe that the surgeon can now pass over tissue, much like ultrasound, much like this laser pointer, and pass over the tissue and be able to look in real time uh, what is happening at or below the margin of that tissue. So when I talk about margins, what I mean, during surgery, that surgeon is going to remove that, that mass, that lumpectomy sample here, and, uh, and really has to determine, is there any tumor cells along that margin? Okay. Well, in our protocol, that, that mass was handed to us in the operating room using either a microscope or this is a needle here, uh, or eventually that handheld probe, and we will collect our intraoperative images and then compare them to what the pathologist will get days later, okay? And that's the comparison. Is our imaging in the operating room just as good or better than that post-op histology? Well, these are some examples. So a negative margin is largely fat cells, adipocytes, and we get this in real time, whereas this came days later. If there's tumor cells present. Tumor cells tend to be dense, and they form a, a dense foci, and those are highly scattering optically. So they show up as dark scattering areas here on that margin of that, that tissue sample. This is one case that this foci of tumor cells was only about a millimeter in size, something that the, the surgeon can't see or feel, uh, but can be picked up on imaging such as this. So we started with our first study uh, looking at ex vivo samples that were taken out, and we scanned them with OCT, and we got very good sensitivity and specificity. So almost every time we found the, two, the, the positive margin in the operating room compared to what they found in histology after the surgery. Uh, so that was very promising. We then moved uh, in later years to our, our in vivo study. So now the surgeon can take this probe, and after the, the mask comes out, to actually scan the cavity and make sure that there's nothing left behind. And, and we, we contend that it's probably equally important to see if anything's been left behind, um, in addition to knowing maybe what you just took out. Uh, and so that showed a sensitivity and specificity of 92%, which is very good numbers in terms of using this for, for clinical decision making. And uh, this is just a, a couple of examples. Um, I hope in, in the, the lighting you can kind of see some differences. Tumor, because it's so dense, shows up as this really dense scattering area. Uh, and this was, for example, if I walk you through this, the, um, the tumor mass was taken out, and we scanned the inside of the in vivo cavity. And because that was in vivo, we don't have histology. But the mass was then scanned, and we did histology, and indeed we found cancer. And, and then an additional margin was taken, so they went in and took another area. Uh, and since that tissue came out, we have histology shows that was cancer. And then we looked at the final margin, which shows that honeycomb appearance. And that was a negative. Now, um, to, much to our surgeon's frustration, we can't use this information for decision making until it's FDA approved. But that should be happening uh, very shortly. So this is just some of the video images that uh, are coming off for this positive margin. And when we have a negative margin, we just see a lot more of that 
that honeycomb structure uh, that's present. So this is something that, again, in real time can provide that, that information for us. The main point of all this is to realize that, that currently we do that microscopic assessment in the path lab you know, days later. And whereas we can be doing this at the point of care or the point of procedure in real time and go from days down to minutes, or even seconds, to be able to provide some diagnostic information about how successful that surgery was. Okay, the last area that I want to talk about is more toward the specialist, and in particular, the pathologist. Because I said, you know, some of the problems we've had is with the pathology, uh, and patho histopathology taking so long. Uh, can we improve upon that, you know, as engineers and try to come up with other solutions? So that's what we thought about. And, you know, histology, histopathology is, is the gold standard. And it's been around for, for centuries, in fact. It's, it's historical. Um, there's been a lot of um, uh, work and development of different stains and dyes to essentially take sections of tissue, stain them appropriately so you could make a diagnosis and figure out, is this cancer, is this normal? Um, this whole process is very time consuming. By the time you, you take out the, the tissue in the first place to, to section it uh, grossly, to put it in little cassettes to go through, to take off thin sections, and then ultimately stain that and put it under a microscope. So it's, it takes hours to days. It's labor intensive. Uh, it's subjective when pathologists read these. And, uh, and it's really only useful for ex vivo specimens. This can't be done in vivo. So it has its limitations. Now, in addition, just in the last decade or two, this whole area of immunohistochemistry has come about. And this is the, the approach of trying to get at molecular histopathology. So the way this works is they will use different types of antibodies or, or structures that will target to specific proteins on these cells in these sections. And let's say a tumor cell expresses more of one receptor than its, its normal counterpart. Well, you can attach a fluorescent label or a, a stain to this, and you wash it over the specimen. And if, in this case, if it shows brown, it means that molecular receptor was present and those are a particular type of tumor cell. So this is one way, but again, this is even more time and labor intensive, more costly. But you know, this is what we want, is to get to a molecular uh, type of diagnosis as well. OK, well, we have a huge infrastructure uh, set up already to do histopathology. Here in the US, you know, we've got 27,000 histotechnologists. Um, we do 40 million blocks of tissue a year. And 300 million microscope slides are generated out of this effort. Costs about $30 a slide. And like I said, it's very time consuming. Well, as engineers, as biophotonics people, we thought about how can we use light in different ways. Now, light is already used to create these images, right? White light, a microscope, looks at the image that's already been stained. But can we do better than, the, than this? Can we generate images in different ways? And the way we thought about doing this was, instead of using stains to give us contrast and to change the color of that tissue specimen, can we actually change the light that we shine on the tissue? And can we have different properties of light that will give us different images and information about those, those tissues? Something about the, the structure that might be present, something about the molecules or the function. So that was really our, our premise. And can we have that tissue and shine different types of light, uh, properties of light on this. So instead of having that one histological section, um, we can now have this ability to generate different types of images and contrast. Now, each one of these represents a nonlinear optical interaction. I won't go into a lot of this detail, but think about it as, as light interacts with the tissue. It's going to vibrate certain molecules. It's going to create different types of contrast. And we can use that information and build up an image uh, based on those, those responses. In fact, we can even combine all of these uh, and try to colorize these to, to match what that stained histology is. All of these uniquely, all these modalities are label free. So we're not adding any dyes or stains, but we're trying to look at the inherent contrast from these tissues. Now, each of these modalities also tells us something about what's going on. So NADH and FAD are autofluorescent 
biomolecules that are responsible for metabolism. So by looking at those, we can tell something about the metabolic state of cells and tissues. We could also identify things such as elastin or proteins or lipids. We can look at collagen. Uh, here's also collagen. So again, this tells us something about the ultrastructure, about the function, and again, without the use of stains or contrast agents. Now, from an engineer, from a mathematical perspective, this starts to get into a lot of data, a lot of information. And I should say that these technologies, all of these are generated at the same time with our, our optical microscope. Uh, we have a unique light source that can, and multiple detectors, so all this information is coming in at the same time. So with that, we had to start thinking about how can we make sense of this high-dimensional data. Now, every pixel in every one of these images corresponds to uh, that physical process. And we thought about, could we develop radar plots that says, uh, overall, do we see most of the signal gravitating in one direction or another? We also, uh, through one of these techniques, gets the spectrum of information that tells us what frequency these, mo these molecular bonds are vibrating in at. And so if we arrange this image information appropriately, we can start to say, OK, this, between this signal, third harmonic generation, and second harmonic generation, that tells us something about optical structure. Okay? Between these two, it tells us something about lipids and proteins and how they're interacting. And this two, these two tell us something about the metabolic activity. And similarly, there's different peaks in these vibrational signatures that tell us about that as well. So we can extract this, this information. And maybe if, if the signal in general from all these methods kind of points up here, well, maybe that's more benign. And if the signal is pointing downward, maybe that's more indicative of cancer. And we can use this multimodal, multidimensional data to, to, to better diagnose what's going on in tissue. Well, this is really our big data challenge. Because we've done studies in, in rat tumor models. We've done studies with human tissue as well. But realize that we have all these different modalities. And each one of these can be collected in three-dimensional volumes. We can image tumor progression over many weeks. And we can do things such as uh, time-lapse imaging, or we can intervene with drugs or various controls. We literally have terabytes of data coming in that we have to now think about, how do we manage this? And I think that's something that's universal in, in many of the, much of the work that you do as well. We've, we've got so much data. Uh, that's why we're excited about artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, all these approaches, because there's going to be patterns in all this data that we can't see visually, that we're going to have to rely on these types of algorithms to, to really sort out and, and bring out for us. OK. Well, what we get are multidimensional data sets like this. This is the same site uh, of a tissue in a rat tumor, and each one is a different modality. And again, all spatially co-registered. We can start to combine those in different ways, different channels, and we start to see the spatial relationships between the different types of uh, physical processes that goes on. So, and again, all of this without stains, without labels, uh, but just in, inherently coming from the tissue itself. So when we combine all this, we get that spatial information, and we can start to see things like blood vessels here. We can, this is a, a nerve that's coursing through here. Uh, the mammary tumor, this happens to be a rat tissue, um, is, is collected down here. These are individual fat cells. And, uh, and very interestingly, you see some little blue dots. I'll come back to those. But those uh, are, are something that you know, we're very excited about because it may tell us new mechanisms of cancer and cancer spread. I just want to go through and show kind of a, an atlas of some of the images uh, that we can get. I wish it was a little bit darker in here because these images really pop uh, you know, in, in a dark room. But these are images, mosaic images, of this multimodal technique. Again, looking at the endogenous contrast coming back. Um, this can be done in vivo. It can be done in real time. And, uh, and so we can start to see things like the vessels and the endothelial cells that line those vessels. Uh, there's just a wealth of information these are those individual cells uh, there. We can start to see some of the, uh, the, the different cells have different uh, colors. So this is yellow. This is more blue. 
we think that's based on the metabolism that those cells are undergoing at that time. Um, here is a, just, again, a magnified view where there's a lot of these little dots, which are exosomes and microvesicles being produced, uh, different types of packaging of, 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 of con constituents going on here. Um, tumor cells are shown up here that have very different optical properties than other cells, uh, again, likely due to the, the difference in metabolism. And, uh, and just a wide array of interesting features. This is, these individual cells have, you can see little point-like objects that are being produced from these, these individual cells. This is another piece of tissue that uh, shows a, a neurovascular bundle. So nerves and blood vessels kind of all sometimes follow the same path. And, and so this here is the lumen of a blood vessel. If you look closely enough, you can see individual red blood cells. Uh, here. This here is the nerve, and we know it's a nerve because the nerve has myelin, a myelin sheath around these axons, and that shows up as a real strong signal, this purple magenta signal. And then we also know that neurovascular bundles are surrounded by fat tissue, fat cells, and that's what all these little globular structures are. The rest of this is stroma, or just normal tissue, fibrous connected tissue, but you can see individual fibroblasts here. The nuclei are dark, um, but those are scattered throughout. If we look at, this is a, a dog carcinoma, and we can see a very well-defined kind of capsule. These are all the tumor cells here that are, have started to expand and grow within this collagen. The green streaks here are the collagen fibers that are, are within that tissue. If we look at human tissue. So this is normal human breast tissue. And what we see here, the green, again, is the collagen fibers, uh, which are readily apparent in the normal breast. And the yellow are elastin fibers to kind of uh, help, again, structurally with that support. And then, of course, some fat cells here. Now, that's in contrast to the human breast tumor, where, again, you see these dark cells that are the tumor cells. You can see the collagen structure has started to change and break up and become very differently organized. So this is really indicative of that growth of those, those tumor cells in human breast tissue. That's, this is ex vivo tissue. This shows in vivo. So in real time, we can see this is the blood flow. This isn't a rat. Um, but we can also see cells that are migrating. These are tumor cells. If you look really closely, you can see cells going in and out of blood vessels. There's one. Um, they get in, and they'll zoom off in the flow. Others will stop and come out of the blood vessel. And over time, this is actually over about 70 minutes sped up, you see there's an accumulation of tumor cells in this particular area. But if you just watch it, focus on one cell and kind of watch it over time, um, it's this really eerie realization of how dynamic a lot of these cells are in, in the living tissue and, um, and what kind of changes that, that take place. The fact that time is a variable is something that we haven't really explored much of in, in terms of the, the biomedical imaging, this optical uh, imaging. And we can learn a lot more from just characterizing the dynamics of those individual cells. I think all these images are, are, are interesting uh, from many aspects. Uh, we've had requests from our surgeons to, to print these out, to put them on their walls, their office walls, as art. Um, it's kind of an eerie sense of, of beauty, but yet we know what, what implications this cancer has for these patients. Um, so it's always interesting what we see, but um, um, you know, the effects of that, too, is, are significant. Okay. The main point, coming back to this, is that we, we get this wealth of data from this multimodal approach, and we get that in minutes as opposed to hours. And... Um, one of our biggest challenges now is to convince pathologists that there's information content in here that is, is just as valuable, if not more valuable, than looking at this static image that's, that's been stained. And so we've, we, it's been mixed. We've had a lot of pathologists really acknowledge that you know, genomic information is coming about, molecular information is important. You know, can we capture that in some way? Um, are they ready to change? But at the same time, so many pathologists are trained and grew up looking at these images that it's very difficult to change, too, and to accept new standards. So that remains to be seen. Um, 
I think hopefully in, in your careers and lifetime, uh, we will see a shift from this gold standard to be perhaps some other gold standard that we can make these, these diagnoses on. Now, I wanted to come back to this particular image and using this technique, this three photon fluorescence, uh, we are able to see, and we were surprised to see when this, we first captured this image, all of these little blue dots. And we wondered what these were. They weren't cells. Uh, they were too small to be cells. They were all in the vessels, but some were outside the blood vessels. And, uh, and we really didn't know at first, you know, why were those signals so strong? What we do know, now know is that these are exosomes and microvesicles. And this is an entirely new way that cells can communicate with other cells throughout the whole body. Um, this has gotten a lot of attention in both the clinical and the biology communities. Two new professional societies have been formed just around the, investigating these exosomes and these microvesicles. So what are these? Well, a cell, uh, even a normal cell, but more commonly in tumor cells, will produce these exosomes, and they will package different molecules in them, proteins, signaling molecules, RNA, DNA. There's a whole host of, of different things that are packaged inside these exosomes, and then they're released by those cells. And these are small. They're 30 to 100 nanometers in size. There are also uh, microvesicles that are butted, butt off from cells, and those too carry information and, and signaling packages. But what happens is that these packages get released into the bloodstream, into the circulation, and are taken up by other cells throughout the body. We know that we're now learning more and more that these exosomes play a role in the signaling, um, not only in cancer and in the tumor microenvironment, but also in many different other ways. They affect the cells in the body. Uh, again, I said these are normal communication mechanisms for how one cell is going to communicate with another cell, perhaps on the other side of the body. Okay, and so they have roles in many different diseases and, and processes that we're still really discovering. But we were very excited because uh, to see this in our imaging, because up until that time, the way that people learned about these is that they would draw out blood or they would uh, grind up tissue and they would centrifuge all this content down for days at very high G-forces to separate these small little exosomes and, uh, and then do this type of mass spec or other analysis on these to figure out what's inside of those. But nobody had been reliably able to image these, particularly even label-free imaging, to understand the spatial context and the dynamics of these exosomes. OK. Well, we see these exosomes not only in those rat models, but we also in human tissue that we get. And so uh, in a number of cases, we've collected breast tumor specimens from the operating room, and uh, even using a portable system that we can take into the operating room to collect these images, we can begin to quantify the, the exosome density and type uh, present in that tumor microenvironment. We've also looked at normal uh, breast tissue coming from breast reduction surgeries. These are women that have no history of cancer but are having breast reduction surgery, and we get that tissue, and we see very little numbers of exosomes, whereas in the tumor tissue, as expected, we see a lot of those exosomes. Some of the studies we're doing is actually showing that <clears throat> these exosomes um, not only are greater in number in the cancer cases, but we can optically identify those exosomes that are more likely to be attributed to more aggressive forms of cancer. So we can perhaps one day extract these from the blood and check not only the number, whether or not cancer might be present, but we can also assess whether that tumor that's present might be more aggressive um, so that's, uh, that that patient might have. So again, to kind of recap the importance here is that these tumor cells produce these exosomes and they send them off into the circulation. And we can see where those go, even in vivo. Those exosomes are taken up throughout, by normal cells throughout the rest of the body. Um, and those cells change their metabolism. They're signaling molecules you know, in those packages that cause those normal cells to change. Okay? And what we believe is that it changes those metabolism, and our entire body becomes preconditioned by these particles. And it's preconditioned 
to then be hospitable for when metastatic tumor cells come later. So this happens very early on. In fact, in early, we found that exosome number is higher in early stage cancer than later stage cancer because we, we think all of these are being put out into the circulation. Now this is, this is somewhat maybe con contrary or contradictive to, to what we've been taught or thinking. You know, we always thought a tumor will grow if it gets large enough, the tumor cells break off, they metastasize, they circulate, they land somewhere, and they grow another, another metastatic tumor. But what this concept is, is suggesting is that there's changes that happen very, very early on, even with a few tumor cells that's already sending out molecules to change our body. And <clears throat> we have a lot of questions, fundamental questions that we now are asking that says, okay, if we take the primary tumor out, what happens to the rest of the body? Does the rest of the body normalize? Do the cells go back to a, a pre-cancer state? Or does the body stay in this preconditioned state? Is this why somebody that has cancer has a much higher risk for recurrent disease or secondary malignancies? Is it because those, those exosomes have already preconditioned our body to be you know, a tumor organ to support a tumor in the future? You may have also heard there's this term called a field effect. And some colleagues in, in, in our field uh, have noticed that when you have, say, a, a colon cancer, uh, deep in your colon, you can sense, uh, you can measure cells at the rectum or, or lower, farther away, and you can sense that there's changes going on. They call that the field effect, but maybe that is these exosomes having an effect, have already spread and, and changing those tumor cells. Now, there is hope here because these exosomes, the, because the way they butt off and because what's on their membrane, if we capture them, they tell us a hint of where they came from, you know, wh what type of tumor they came from. And they also tell us where they might be going to. So we know that these tend to accumulate in certain other organs. And so just by capturing some of these, uh, again, this is, hasn't been shown, but we, we hope that these can tell us where that tumor is going and where it's coming from. And that can provide us a lot more information about what might be happening. Okay. Well, I think that a lot of what I've shown you today, uh, this technology, this interface of engineering, and medicine, and, and biology, uh, is really driven by, by this idea. And that is, we identify these healthcare needs. And in the case of imaging, we develop that imaging technology we find clinical applications of it, and we call translational research going from the bench to the bedside. But I would contend that's only half our responsibility. The other responsibility is to go from that patient to the population to really transform healthcare. And to do that, we have to benchmark our new technology against the standard of care. And we have to really work at integrating and having new technologies adopted. That's, that's not a small task by any means uh, because, again, there's a standard that's out there. And how do you change that standard? This is what we need, though, to transform. And it really is commercialization, it's dissemination, it's investments by industry, by government, by private foundations that allows us to, to sort of carry this on to truly make a transformational change. Now, in the spirit of these Jones seminars, um, I've talked about the science, the technology, and I'm touching on a little bit of the impact on society. But I think we also have this obligation to think about this impact of technology and, and imaging technology. <clears throat> and the point I want to bring up is that our healthcare costs are unsustainable. So if we look, this came from the MIT Technology Review a couple years ago, and the United States is really just have, has this astronomically increasing healthcare costs compared to other high-income countries. And um, these are expenditures on healthcare as percentage of GDP. Uh, if we look even more closely, we can see that our healthcare spending is linked, of course, to longer lives, um, but you know, we spend badly here in the US. We are isolated out here in terms of the costs that we spend <clears throat> for longevity or life expectancy. It's not even the, the, the longest life expectancy. Uh, for the, the dollars that we put in. So historically, technology has a bad reputation of driving up, uh, as being responsible for this. Right here in the United States, 
We, we want to take advantage of every innovation and every technology that we, we can develop uh, if it's going to improve people's lives. But we have to also be conscious and, and cognizant of, of these types of implications. So we have to change that reputation from technology driving up healthcare costs to, to ask, you know, can, can technological innovation improve the quality of our healthcare, which I think it has, but can it reduce the cost? And can we make this technology and our healthcare more widely accessible? Those are going to be some of the questions that we have to honestly address um, with the technology and the innovations that we develop. Now, a, a little bit of a plug. At the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, we, we, we've been thinking about this for a while. We're actually developing an entirely new college of medicine uh, from scratch that's technology, that's engineering-based. And so students, medical students, not only will have the basic science and clinical science, but also will have engineering science and technology principles taught as part of that medical curriculum. And we want new medical students, new physicians, ultimately to be thinking about their patient not only in the compassionate you know, caregiver way, but, but also from you know, an engineer's perspective of solving problems, of, of trying to come up with innovative solutions, technological solutions that can really affect uh, the quality of healthcare. I think that you know, technology is really advancing medicine. Um, you know, imaging and visualization is, is probably at the front line of a lot of this in terms of advancing that medicine. It's also happening in the surgical suite and, and what you have here at, at Dartmouth and, and being able to you know, um, infuse this high technology to have better outcomes. It's also happening in the path lab, in genomics, in our ability to do personalized um, sampling and, and understand our genome and what implications that has uh, for disease. But we collectively have this potential right, to lead, to define, to engineer the future of, of medicine and the future of, of healthcare. And we really need to because these are major problems that we have to solve. And uh, you know, it's all of you and, and all of us that are, are, have the capability, the ability to do this. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer. <laughs>